Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing great. If you've got a copy of the Bible, if you would open to a supplemental text to the one we just read, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. If it were appropriate to give yourself a high five, I would give myself a high five this morning. Since I'm the one who selects the teaching texts and the topics for our sermons uh, each week after plumbing the depths of Hebrews 6 last week, uh, I am delighted to have a bit more straightforward passage this week. Uh, I am uh, thankful to consider this text, which is a bit more bite-sized and, like I said, a bit, uh, a bit easier to decipher for us, though I don't want to suggest in, in considering it easier to decipher that it's any less important. This is a critically important uh, matter that we're going to consider this morning. We're going to do this at about a six-week pace until the end of the year. We'll go five or six weeks in Hebrews, take a week where we consider a topic that's really pertinent to the life of our church, and then jump back into the book of Hebrews. So next week we'll be in Hebrews 6, verse 13, but this week we're going to take a commercial break and consider 1 Peter 5 on the role of pastors. So let me pray uh, for us. Our Father, we bow thanking you that your word so relevant to the complexities of our lives, that you speak to so many matters that are important to us and instructive for the lives that we live. We ask for your help this morning as we think uh, on this topic. Would you bolster our confidence in you and your ultimate leadership of us and specifically of your local church and the community that we have here? Would you guide our thoughts and would you help us to obey in the places that you press us? In Christ's name, amen. I think we live in a world where universal agreement about pretty much anything is impossible. Uh, if I said this morning the grass is green, some of you would respond, well, not always, or not mine, or have you seen teal grass? right? Uh, it seems like particularly any statement that's made from a kind of a public forum uh, gets undermined or questioned. We live in that type of culture. But I think I have it this morning. I think I have a premise that we're all going to agree on, a premise that will be universally accepted. In fact, I'm going to go one step further and say it would not just be universally accepted in this room, but it would be universally accepted in your neighborhood, in your workplace, wherever you live, Christian and non-Christian alike. Here it is. Leaders matter. Anybody want to challenge it? We'll, we'll go right now, all right? Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, leaders matter. Now, we were all sorts of differences on what type of leaders we need, who those leaders should be, what makes a good leader after they're in that role. But whether you're talking about an elephant farm, five guys, or a country, leaders matter. The people that are in charge give guidance and shape the culture of that place. Not only is it true that most organizations take on the personality of their leaders, but the success or failure of an organization as a whole tends to speak to the quality or lack thereof of its leaders. Now, while we shouldn't use terms like success or failure to speak of the local church, nor should we equate our leaders with that of the business world, the same premise holds true for the church. The health of the church rises and falls on her leaders. This is not a universal rule, but it is generally true that if you give a church good leaders, she will thrive. If you give her bad leaders, she will struggle. Leaders matter. So where do we look? Where do we look to understand the leaders that we need for the church? We can look for cult at culture and try to grab worldly definitions of leaders. Or we could do what we attempt to train ourselves to do regularly at CFC, which is just train ourselves to go to the scriptures and see, has God spoken on this subject? Is, is there a word from the Lord that we should consider that would have primacy over any cultural stereotypes we might have? And thankfully, God has. God knew that human leaders of the church mattered so much that he spoke some of the most clear words in all of the New Testament regarding this topic. 
I'm going to use 1 Peter 5 as my guide this morning, but we could pull the entirety of Acts chapter 20, uh, the entirety of 1 Timothy chapter 3, the entirety of Titus chapter 1 to consider this very same subject. And alongside of that, we could consider some four dozen samplings of Scripture that speak to the role of elders, pastors over God's people in the church. So what I'm going to do this morning is pretty simple. I want to look at 1 Peter 5, 1 through 6. I want to make some comments. I want to kind of exposit this text for us, help us to see what Peter is saying here, and then I'm going to make some specific comments about the way we're going to deploy pastors and leaders here at CFC. All right, so let's jump in with verse 1 here. Conclusion to the letter, my header just says, about the elders, uh, kind of an editorial note. Verse 1, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory that's about to be revealed. Verse 2, shepherd God's flock among you. Now let's pause there. Two points, two big ideas. What do pastors do? First, pastors shepherd God's people. Pastors' primary responsibility is to shepherd God's people. Now, you'll note, if you're a careful listener, that I just substituted a word. I substituted the word pastor here for verse 1 in your text, which says elder. Is such a substitution justifiable? I, I think so. Various places in the New Testament where this office, this role is mentioned, these various descriptions, these terms, are used somewhat interchangeably. For example, this from Acts 20, uh, this is Paul leaving his role three years in Ephesus, and in Acts 20, can we advance that slide for me? Yeah, great. Uh, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and he summoned the there, and you see the term, the elders of the church. And then down in verse 28 and 29, be on the guard for yourselves and for all the flock which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers, that word episkopos, we have a whole denomination that kind of bars that tag there, overseers to shepherd, here specifically pastor, the flock of God. So these seem to be uh, uniquely interchangeable terms that denote something of the role this person is going to take. There are certainly word studies that can be used to differentiate the various focuses of those words, but it seems that the New Testament simply borrows a category that would have been common in the ancient Near East, that of elders. And you would see those not just in local churches, but this would be true of the overall communities, right? Elders would be known for their wisdom and their leadership. Therefore, they would give oversight to local communities of people. Here the term gets applied to local churches, and it gets applied in a formal office, one of two mentioned in the New Testament. It's clear that it's a formal role in these smattering of references we see. So Philippians 1, notice the introduction here. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including, and here the formal mention of elders, overseers, episkopos, and deacons. So the two New Testament offices, we would see that again in 1 Timothy 3, where qualifications are mentioned first for elders and then for deacons. 1 Timothy 3, the text I just mentioned, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. Then the list continues. What's distinct isn't the title. What's distinct is what these people do, what these men do. Look in verse 2 of our text this morning. What, what do elders do specifically when it's applied to the church? They shepherd a flock. Now, now here, the, the, this is picking up on imagery that's throughout the scriptures. It's not flattering imagery to us, but it pictures people as sheep. Okay? Uh, again, not a flattering uh, uh, description for any of us, heightening our need for someone to lead and guide us, our folly to deviate from the way. And so God, in his kindness, gives human leaders who play a role in shepherding the flock. And here's where the term pastor shows up. Pastor literally means shepherd. That, that's what the term means. So while elder may emphasize leadership and oversight, 
elders pastor. The role of pastor presses the idea that those human leaders care for the people of God. Something like, you know, uh, some dude with the last name Puddle being a meteorologist, right? It's like, I mean, you're set up for that, right? What does a pastor do? A pastor shepherds. It's baked into the title. But you, you can't separate those two. This is what the name implies. So if we were shortening the verse 1, elders pastor God's people. Elders pastor. That's what they do. The exact structure of these rules, roles and the way people use them tend to be forks in the road that separate different denominations. Some ways certain groups have adopted various titles and they associate those with the denominations and kind of become tributaries the way, uh, uh, the way we think about the Lord's Supper or baptism become tributaries in denominational streams. So uh, the Presbyterians got elder, right? Um, uh, uh, Pentecostal groups tend to get bishop, right? And uh, the Baptists got pastor, right? Uh, though those tend to go along denominational lines, that's something that we kind of need to wash out of our minds because these terms are used interchangeably in the scriptures to refer to the role. So while it may seem weird to you to be in a Baptist church and hear people speak of elders, what, what I want, wanted to show is that that, that is derived from the, the scriptures that don't differentiate between those. We do have slight differences at CFC, though to be an elder is to be a pastor and to be a pastor is to be an elder. We do have some who spend their full-time vocational lives in the work of eldering and pastoring. That's what I do. And then we have some pastors who do this in a voluntary way. They have marketplace jobs that they hold outside of the local church. That's where they receive their income. But they invest their lives similarly, not like a varsity league, JV league team, but similarly pastoring God's people in service to the body. Don't let these sidesteps and semantics, though, betray the point. The point is that leaders in the church, pastors, do so. They hold their office with an intent to care for people, to shepherd people. And to do this well, elders have to be able to do three things. One, they, they have to, to know God in order to give faithful direction to the sheep. They have to know God so that they can instruct the flock in the way that they should go. This is inherent in the, the term itself, an actual shepherd. He has some knowledge of where the sheep need to go in order to thrive. So too, the pastor of God's people is given guidance through God's word and through prayer, and he seeks to, to apply that to a flock such that the people under his care thrive. This is at the core of the pastoral task, word and prayer. Ministering the word of God to the people of God and praying for the people of God such that they thrive. In Acts 6, there's a physical issue presented among the widows of the church. The first deacon team, or at least the seedlings of that is formed. And these uh, uh, early apostles suggest we're not going to get distracted from this, caring for the widows, so that we can devote ourselves. And their mention is two things, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This is the primacy of what pastors do. They pray and they minister the word to God's people. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul provides a character trait list, what Carly just read for us, for pastors. And really only one skill set is mentioned. It's in verse 2. It's that those pastors be apt to teach, able, capable, willing to teach. Said another way, synonymously, that they, they would be the kind of people who can minister the word of God to the people of God. Now, we tend to equate this to formal pulpit ministry, and this is at least in part true. It's a central way that I minister the word of God to the people of God. But this is not the only way pastors minister the word of God to the people of God. They shepherd people by bringing the word of God to bear on lives of people throughout the week, through counsel and care, through bedside visits in the hospital, through small group conversations, through 
informal prayer in the hallway, through email replies and phone calls of encouragement, and on and on the list can go. They minister the word of God to the people of God, and they play a key role in keeping bad words out. This is Acts 20. Protect the flock of God from wolves that are going to come in. And primarily in the New Testament, when wolves infest the church or the people of God, it's in the form of bad teaching. It's bad doctrine that infests the church. And so he says, pastors, be really careful that you're ministering the word of God appropriately and that you're protecting them from deviations in doctrine. Both in Acts 20 nervously suggest from within and from without these wolves are going to come. So be on your guard. So like a good shepherd, elders use their words to give direction to keep people from harm and to lead them to places they will thrive. And they do this by not depending on their wisdom alone, but by speaking God's words to God's people. Here, I really like the language that Eugene Peterson uses to describe the pastor's task. He says the central role of the pastor is to keep the people attentive to God. I think this is really beautiful. To keep the people attentive to God. He goes on to, to challenge uh, that we live in a world where most of the people that we deal with most of the time are most attentive to themselves and not to God. So the pastor is going to have to keep standing before them and reminding them, listen to God. Here's what God said. Be attentive to God. Block out your distractions. That's the pastor's task. So we keep people attentive to God by bringing God's word before them, praying for them, pressing them to move in ways that are for their good and for God's glory. And as another old adage suggests, the pastor's primary task is to help people die well. To help people die well. Meaning they invest their lives in building into people the type of faith that can allow them to confront life's greatest enemy with confidence and hope. In a very real way, the pastor leads people through the valley of the shadow of death called this life and escorts them into eternity. They've got to know God, be able to apply God's word. Secondly, they've got to know people. They've got to know people so that they can apply God's word to that specific flock. Look at verse 2. Uh, let me shift my emphasis here. So we press on the, the theme of shepherding, that their primary uh, focus is not charisma, it's not business acumen, it's not all the details of running an organization, it's caring for people. That's the primary thing they're doing. Look in verse 2. Let's put the emphasis on the last two words of verse 2. The last, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the last two words of that first part of the phrase. Shepherd God's flock among you. That's where I want to zero in. The flock that's among you. The call is to shepherd specific people. Now, there's some intramural implications here, and I want to be really careful not to disparage churches that do it differently than we do on matters here, but it seems to me that this presses us in at least two ways. First, Pastors have to know who their flock is. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. You say, well, man, church membership isn't in the Bible. And I'll grant you that point, at least not in an overt form. But it's seemingly required as an application here. To shepherd a flock that is among you means I have to and we have to know who we're giving care over. Pastors simply can't apply this job assignment to merely whoever shows up on Sunday morning because I don't know most of you. I know some of you. And if I'm going to give an account for shepherding the flock that is uh, among me, I've, I've got to know who that flock is. I've got to know the fluffy sheep and the uh, splotchy sheep and the honorary sheep, right? You know? I've got to know specifically who are, and yes, I was not looking at anybody when I said splotchy or fluffy sheep. You've got to know who people are. I mean, imagine if you were a teacher and you get a contract at the beginning of the year that says, teach second grade. You say, to whom? They say, well, whoever shows up in your class on Monday morning and then again on Tuesday morning and then again on Wednesday morning and then you, you can't apply a job description if you don't know the specifics of the people that you're seeking to attend to. You need a roster. You need real names and real people that you can account for. 
And secondly, you have to pastor among people. You have to know them, and you have to pastor among them. Pastors are fellow church members, and therefore they're in the mix of the needs and the complexities of those they are serving and those that they are teaching. So let's apply the image from the text this morning, that of shepherding. Let's imagine the first century shepherds got together and they called a backyard party. And they said, hey, bros, this job would get far easier if we just put up a bunch of billboards out everywhere. And on one side, we wrote in language that sheep can understand. And on the other side, we wrote in language that wolves can understand. And we just kind of periodically pointed. And then we could kind of put our shepherd's face up on those billboards and let them kind of uh, autopilot say the general things that would be true generally for general sheep in a general place wouldn't be nearly as helpful, would it? Shepherds are among a specific flock, and they know that flock, and they're attentive to that flock, and they're caring for that flock, and they're ministering the word to those specific people. The act of shepherding necessitates personal presence. And in my estimation, the best preaching does as well. While an A-plus sermon by a gifted orator coming to you through your earbuds while you're changing air filters can inform or challenge or instruct you, it is meant to be a supplemental diet to the specific care that you are receiving through local church ministries by people who know you, pray for you, and are attempting to help you follow God at a specific place and a specific time. That was wordy, but I think it's important. Specific people who know you, love you, pray for you, and are attempting to shepherd you at a particular point in time. So they got to know God, they got to know people, and then they got to know one another. They've got to know one another. And specifically the so that here, so that they can attend to the entire flock. So that they can care for uh, all the people. Look back in verse 1. Let me shift the emphasis one more time. We're belaboring this point, but shepherd... The flock that's among you, and then the call here specifically in verse 1, is to elders. To the singular letter that makes this idea not a singular elder, but plural elders. Pastors who are doing this work over a flock. Now, I won't be able to do this point justice, so I hope you're a note taker because it'll help a bit. But it bears mentioning that we're breaking with some patterns in the way that we organize this here at CFC. The point that we want to heighten is that to care for this flock that God has entrusted, we need multiple people doing that. We need as many as God sends our way who know God's word, who pray for God's people, who know the people well, who apply God's word to the intricacies of their life. And you're going to need more than one pastor to do that for the current 328 members of our flock. Got to have multiple people doing that. And there's ample descriptive evidence in the Bible that this was true of the earliest church communities, that they were led not by a singular senior pastor, but rather by a collection of pastors or elders, plural. Again, this would have been common in the ancient Near East. Elders would have been a collective group of people, not just a singular specific person, but a collection of people. And we see this mentioned. Verse 1 in our passage the elders among you. In Acts 20, remember the text from verse 17, they're called to summon the elders, plural, of the church in Ephesus, singular. Now, granted, we don't exactly know how that church was gathering. We don't know what the form was. I'm not sure. So I think there's some grayness here in exactly how those elders administrate their care. But you have plural elders over a singular church. Titus 1, Paul's instructions to Titus and Crete. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone and to appoint elders, plural, in every town. Every place there was a local church, we're going to have plural elders administering their care over God's people in that place. James 5 is probably the most overt of this. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him. Again, elders, plural, church, singular. 
It's this team of united pastors who work together to care for the flock of God and the specific place and the time. In addition to the descriptive evidence we see, there is uh, tons of prudence in having a plurality of leaders in local church communities. I'll merely note these reasons why a church should operate this way, and I can't expound on these due to our time constraints. But a church that's led by a team of pastors rather than a singular pastor gets the benefit of diverse gifts in in leading God's people. You get the benefit this morning of adding to our care one with tremendous bedside manner and grace like Jonathan Borsick. You get the privilege of adding to our team the gifts in prayer of somebody like Warren Payton. We get the collective benefit of someone with uh, the, the ability to teach specifically like Donnie Mathis. You get the diversity of gifts and friends, frankly, there is no omnicompetent leader. So by having plural leaders, we train ourselves away from looking to one person to do everything. The church is cared for on a more personal level. As every member of the church has a pastor who knows them and their spiritual condition and needs. The church makes better decisions because there are multiple people grappling with complex matters. In the move that we're making this morning, you go from five men making decisions about the leadership of the church to ten. That means as a group, as a flock, you're better cared for because our ideas are going to be refined in that collective community. The church, this is huge, uh, the church is protected should a single pastor disqualify himself due to sin or face an untimely death. The church connected to that, doesn't change drastically when one pastor resigns or moves to another church. Perhaps you've been a part of these assemblies where you you love the congregation there and you were invested and then the pastor resigned to take a post elsewhere and then it was left up to a search committee who spent 18 months trying to hire somebody and then they hired somebody and it took him another 18 months to actually lead and by that time, three years later, the church just felt and looked and acted totally differently. By having 10 leaders, you remove any one of those elements and the church rocks on. Who would pastor our church should something happen to me? Well, the pastors. The very same pastors that you have pastoring you now. Would that be a loss? I hope so. Would there be a felt absence in the body? I hope so. But the church would rock on. We don't have to have a search committee. We don't have to have leadership teams to make this happen. But the church is pastored as they are faithfully being pastored. Church has healthy leaders because no one's expected to do anything. Uh, For example, right now, uh, Hugh and Holly have not been here for, what, six weeks now or so? They're doing a sabbatical right now. I mean, that doesn't happen in churches that don't have plurality. We can rock on and continue the ministry while giving somebody the the space to catch their breath. Uh, The church isn't prone to idolizing the voice or charisma of any one leader. The church's leaders have accountability among themselves so nobody is isolated. And the church sees people operating in community, which sets a healthy model for how other Christians should live and act as well. So biblically and prudence, a group of leaders is best for God's people. Second main idea this morning. Pastors shepherd God's people. They do it by knowing God, by knowing people, and by knowing one another so they work together well. Secondly, pastors provide an example for God's people. They shepherd them, and then they walk the path that they're shepherding them toward. Look again in verse 2. How do they do this? Shepherd the flock of God among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those who are entrusted to you, but by being examples to the flock. Peter provides these three contrasts, and it seems to me that they're largely distinguishing pastoral work from the nature of leadership in the world at large. Remember Jesus' famous contrast, the, 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 the kings of the Gentiles lord it over you, but it shouldn't be so among you. So this is the contrast. Uh, out of compulsion, no, do it willingly. Greedy, no, be eager for the work. Lording it over, no, be an example. 
Pastors don't pastor because they have to. They genuinely want to help people. They aren't doing it to manipulate or take advantage of others. They're eager to care. And they don't take their position as a means of dominating people. But they strive to lead by example. And it's this last idea, being examples to the flock, that's epitomized in the reading that Carly did for us from 1 Timothy 3. Remember the text, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, there's a, there it is that I mentioned earlier, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have children under control with all dignity. If he doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? Must not be a new convert or he'll become conceited and he'll incur the same condemnation as the devil. Further, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into the disgrace of the devil's trap. What's remarkable about this list is the unremarkable nature of the list. And what I mean by that is you don't see any unique traits on this list. Rather, they are the marks of Christian virtue. They are the marks of the Spirit's activity in and among the people of God. This is what genuine Christians should do. And therefore, pastors are living out the genuine Christian life in such a way that they serve as an example to those that they are leading. A few things are worth notice on this list. The list starts with the idea of being above reproach. It does not mean that the pastor is perfect in all of these areas. Lest he be perceived as being categorically other than you. You're not perfect in these areas either. He's like you in sanctification, a pilgrim along the way. But he should be pursuing these traits. He should be repenting quickly when he strays. He should be holding himself to a high standard that sets his life off as one that is worthy of emulating and one that should compel you to listen to what he has to say. There's nothing worse than somebody trying to instruct you with words that their life discredits. So follow people whose lives back up the content that they're communicating. You'll also notice that the pastor's home is a test case. Doesn't this make complete sense? If his teaching and his example are going to matter, then they're going to matter most in the place that he spends the most of his time, in his home. It doesn't mean that his kids or his marriage is perfect, but it does mean that you should be able to look to his home to see what happens to people who are under his care. Do the people who are under his care thrive, or are they crushed? And that gives you a test case for what's going to happen if that person is leading in the church. Unique trait on the list, the perspective of outsiders, verse 7. See how other people, even other people who don't follow Jesus, respond to him. Is he, is he worthy of respect? Does he carry himself maturely? Do people, even those who might disagree with his teaching, see a distinct way of life in this person? And there's a final warning baked in. It's baked in parenthetically, and then in verse 6, explicitly, don't do this to a new convert. In other words, and this presses our Baptist culture a bit, as a general rule, it's really unwise, nigh foolish, to take a 19-year-old and call him a youth pastor. These virtues are like the black-eyed peas and collards on January 1st. They slow cook. You are not going to get there quickly. And so don't be hasty to lay hands on someone and commission them to the work. See what's happening in their soul over time and in their home over time. It's as if Paul was reading our national headlines today. Don't put someone in leadership too quickly or else they're going to get puffed up with pride and they're going to end up doing more harm than good. Be patient. Get good elders, not quick ones. Get good elders, not quick ones. With that in mind, to what I believe are good elders, a word of charge to our pastors. I have two charges, one to the pastors and then one to you, the church. 
specifically to the pastors, this idea of giving a, a charge to someone with some measure of authority or importance would be common. A person who's walked the path would issue something like an authoritative command to those stepping into the new post. And in the New Testament, this is often accompanied by what we'll do in just a moment, laying on of hands in the work, pl- placing some sense of a stamp of approval congregationally on them. You might see a pastor give a charge to a newlywed couple, university president to college graduates. Paul sets this example in the close to his uh, writing to his mentee, Timothy. Here's the way 2 Timothy uh, functionally ends. I solemnly charge you before God and Jesus Christ, who's going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. They'll multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they don't want to hear. They'll turn away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, and specifically as for you, the ten of us brothers, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We have five new men stepping into this role formally at our church this morning, seeking to fulfill the ministry of pastoring this flock. They've been assessed by the pastors over the last year and by uh, recommendation brought before the church for a congregational vote two weeks ago. And each is beginning their pastoral duties here today. To those five men and to the five of us that are presently in that role, I want you to hear, I want your eyes to, to land on verse 4 of our text this morning was Peter right? When the chief shepherd appears, you also will receive the unfading crown of glory. Peter reminds us that our service, while important to the church, is not ultimately to the church, but to God. In this way, we once again set an example for the people that we're caring for. We serve, we live to the praise and glory of God alone. Brothers, there's much at stake in the work of pastoring and pastoring well. There are titles and there's teaching and there's leadership and there's authority that we wield on behalf of others. For the most part, we will never know the outcome of our work. Our job isn't any harder than many of those in in our care but it does come with a unique burden, with hidden tears, with frustrating emails, with anguishing counseling sessions, with difficult decisions, and with the ever-present weight of seeing people on their worst days. What sustains such work? Well, it's the same thing that sustains the entirety of the Christian life, isn't it? It's the fact that we pastor under the care of the great pastor, verse four. Jesus Christ, who is presently and actively pastoring us while we pastor people. Though we may not know how, we labor in hope that there's, there's a coming day when the fertile pastures of our heavenly home will make the dark valleys of our present shepherding a long-forgotten reality. And in a way that only he could, Spurgeon captures this reality beautifully. Comparing his ministry to that of Bunyan and his great writing in Pilgrim's Progress, when he says about his pastoral task, I'm occupied in no small way, as Mr. Greatheart was employed in Bunyan's day. I don't compare myself to that champion, but I am in the same line of business. I'm engaged in personally conducted tours to heaven. I have with me at the present time, dear old faithful honest, or dear old father honest. I'm glad that he's still alive and active. And there's Christina and her children. It's my business as best I can to kill dragons and to cut off giants' heads and to lead on the timid and the trembling. I'm often afraid of losing some of the weaklings. Y'all can read the rest. A charge to the church. A charge to pastors, a charge to the church. I told you there were two. Guys, be faithful. Submit under the lordship of Christ. 
run to his praise. But then to you, to you, church, look in the words of verse 5 and 6. In the same way you who are younger, be subject to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Church, you have the distinct privilege that sheep do not have. You too, like me, can hear and respond to the great shepherd's leading. You possess the image of God, and as church members, you've declared yourself to be Christians, meaning you possess the Spirit's presence and power in your life. The same joy-filled, eager shepherding that is expected of pastors is the way you should, too, hear and heed God's activity through their leadership. A church thrives when she has joy-filled, eager pastors serving a joy-filled, eager church. Simply put, you can make pastoring a joy or a grind. We'll get there in due time, but consider this from the end of the book of Hebrews. The passage speaks of leaders, not pastors, but I think the context strongly suggests that what is in view here is pastors of local churches. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. The human spirit and the modern moment tend to bristle and find these ideas scandalous. The two words that start, obey and submit. In fact, were I standing here on my own authority alone this morning, I can't think of anything more presumptuous than to lecture a community of people about obeying and submitting. But there it is in black and white not on my authority, but on the authority of God's word, that those who are given care through leaders and local assemblies should do so reverently, submissively, and obediently. Now, there's an assumption behind this. There's a huge caveat. You better find a church with elders who fit the two marks that I outlined at the start. Because if you get in a church with bad elders, you're going to get ripped to shreds. And you have all sorts of trouble, and then you got to figure out how to leave that church. How to, so there's all sorts of assumptions behind this. But if you find a church where the general trajectory of their leaders fits those characteristics, then invest your life there. And when you invest your life, make your aim to be as easy to pastor as possible. Make your aim to be as easy to pastor as possible. Be the sheep that is at the shepherd's bidding looking for, how can you help me get to places that I thrive? The two motives are supplied in verse 17 that I just read, Hebrews 13. Why should you do that? Because they're going to have to give an account for how they care for you. Now that's meant to sound really encouraging to you and really terrifying to me, right? Right? Not exactly sure that I know all of what given account means, but I know that I'm going to be answerable to God for the care that I've given to this little flock called Christ Fellowship. Even bigger, I won't be answering alone, but there's some other brothers alongside of me who are going to give an account for the care that we've given to you. On your end, it's meant to be really encouraging because it means you don't always have to get your way. You don't always have to solve every dilemma. The church doesn't always have to fit your preferences. The leaders don't always have to do the things exactly like you would love them to. They're going to give an account not to you but to God, and he's way better at settling scores. And then practically, verse 17, make your pastor's work a joy because it's for your good. How about a self-serving motive, <laughs> right? But isn't this true? Isn't it true in your home? Isn't it true as you're leading your children? Like if people are finding what they're doing a joy, it's going to be better for all of them in that community. 
Leaders who know you, who have your back, who value what you do. So here are just some concluding suggestions, church. A charge to you. Five ways you can help us. Find a time each week to pray for us by name and let us know when and how you prayed. Technology's given us scores of tools. We've got some people in our church that just send me an emoji regularly. I won't tell you what the emojis are, but uh, he says, whenever I send this, this lets you know that I just prayed for you. And I can't tell you how encouraging and how random those times are. Do that. I prayed this scripture for you. I was thinking of this. Voice a call, leave a message. Secondly, address concerns that you might have in person. Address concerns that you might have in person. Privately and in person, let us care, believe the best about us, and receive the leadership that God wants to give through, uh, through our uh, instruction. Go out of your way to share stories of ways that your pastor's ministry is a blessing to you. Go out of your way to share stories of ways that your pastor's ministry is a blessing to you. I love, I've said this before, I love to cut grass because I can see grass that I just mowed. Pastoring is hard to see. So anytime you are blessed by the ministry of those who are leading, make sure you tell them. Let, let them know that you notice them leading you to a place that you can thrive. Plan practical ways to encourage your pastor's wife and family who often bear added burden from the pastor's ministry. And then lastly, celebrate the work of all the pastors not merely the ones who spend the majority of the time in front. Why is this good for you, church? Back in verse 5 and 6. Why? Because it humbles you. It trains you to not look out for your own interests, but to look out for the interests of others. And think Philippians 2 here. This is ground zero of the Christian life. If you do it for your leaders, you're going to do it for others. Your church is going to be bolstered. The Spirit is going to grow you in your sanctification. So this morning, we commission these five to the work, and in so doing, we commission you, church, to care for us as we seek to care for you, such that this little flock in Greenville makes it safely home. I'm going to pray for us to close our time this morning, and after I do, we're going to sing a song of reflection after receiving the Lord's Supper together, and then we'll come and have a time to lay hands on these brothers and commission them for the work. Our Father, we thank you that you are shepherding us, that you are the chief shepherd who works through little shepherds to give care to your flock. And we recognize that we live in a time where it seems that leaders are dropping left and right. And so we praise you for faithful leaders who are attempting to humbly and honorably steward the flock that's entrusted to our care here. We thank you for sending uh, new leaders our way, and we ask that you would give us strength and guidance to care for your people such that we will find fertile fields, blessing and sustenance here in this life as we await our heavenly home, as we remember this sacrificial love that is demonstrated to, from leaders to local churches, we're mindful of the ultimate work of Jesus Christ, who did not look out for his own interests, did not count equality with God something to be held on to, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. We pray that that would be the mark, the leaders in this church as well. We ask that for Christ's sake. Amen.